Patrick was both a fantastic young player with tacit knowledge, and now he's in the position of having to be a coach and explicitly translate that into making other young players really good. So it's actually a very difficult thing to do. Um, so we're just going to try, I'm going to simply ask questions and then try and absorb all of your tacit knowledge and then take credit for it at another time explicitly. <laughs> um, so I think what we'll do is we'll start with the title of, uh, which is Eye on the Ball. Um, the, this is the hardest question. After this, that they get easier. It's going to easier. Yeah. Um, a billion people on, are estimated to have watched the World Cup final. A billion. Um, and I remember I was interviewed by Scientific American a number of years ago, and they, it was about dancing. They, wanted, they said, why do people watch other people move around funny? Okay. Um, but you could ask the question even more profoundly, which is why, if an alien were to come from outer space, they would say, why are a billion people, and it's actually accumulatively at a World Cup, 30 billion viewings, watching grown men kick a sphere around? Why do we like to watch, and it's mainly men, uh, grown men hit a ball with a stick? So the first question, which we, ha we don't have an answer to, but I'd love to hear what you have to say, is what is it with men and their balls? <laughs> <laughs> this is a really good start. This is a really good start. Why is it such a secular religion? I think that's why we're talking about Soccer in Europe, we call it football. We call it as a sport, but it is more than the sport. It's a way of living the life. It's more than the religion. It's the passion, and especially for kids like myself, because I grew up in Africa. I grew up in Senegal, and uh, we moved to uh, to France when I was eight years old. And football was uh, an easy way to. Um, to get a better life, I will say it. It was sport, and um, I had a small talent. So it was for me, how can I use the small talent to get something that I can support my family? So it is a sport, yes, but it became more than the sport for myself. And when you look at the majority of the players who go into sport, is more than that. So for me, Soccer or sport or football, like you, you like to call it, uh, make my education. Because of football, I managed to, to go to places that I never even dream about. When I was born in Senegal, I never knew that one day I would be coaching in New York. And football bring me here. So it is more than just the sport. So I use my small talent to, to be where I am today. So, okay, um, we'll get to the, a possible answer to that. So it's true, right? And some people have argued that soccer, it's such a giant, varied thing that it almost models the complexity of the world as a microcosm. Um, now, another thing that comes up a lot is talent. Everyone uses the word natural ability, gifted, talented, um, and yet, when you try and get scientific traction on the term talent, it's extremely difficult. In fact, some people will argue that it doesn't exist. Okay, now, you all go, no, that's ridiculous, right? This Patrick is, a, was very this is what I was going to say. Yes, yes right. <laughs> so, so wh why, what is the problem with the notion of talent? Okay, well, there are two schools. Right? One is, there was a book that came out by a journalist um, called The Sports Gene. And the idea there is that there are genes and that somehow you're born with the ability. Um, and then there's a very famous work done by a psychologist, a psychologist called Anders Ericsson where Malcolm Gladwell got his 10,000 hour rule from. Okay? So you have these two poles. You were born with the ability, or you just practiced the hell out of it more than everybody else. Okay, now, they're not mutually exclusive ideas, and we can get to the way that there may be a subtle interaction between the notion of being born gifted, 
versus practicing your way to being good, and it's a huge area of contention up until this day. In sports, especially now when you're a coach, you want to go recruiting and go talent spotting, right? So I'd be interested to hear your view. Is, are people just born with it? And you, it's just the luck of the draw? And you just happen to be a kid in Senegal who just happened to see a ball and you started kicking it around and wow, your foot and the ball were made for each other? Or something else going on? I think you have to, I believe in both. And I think when you look at in the modern game, you look at that the two best players in the world at the moment. We're talking about Cristiano Ronaldo and we're talking about Messi. And my opinion is that Messi born with that talent because I saw him in training and a friend of mine who played with him is not the best in training. He really doing what he's doing because of his natural talent. In the other side, you had Cristiano Ronaldo and played against him and look at him in training. He's got this talent because of his work ethic. He is where it is because is working twice more than everybody else. So we have both players who, one is really talented because he born that, like I personally believe, and the other one because of this work they take. If you talk about myself, I had a talent, but it wasn't enough. So I need to work harder to get where I was. And we always talking about the technical, physical, talent, but in our world, we don't talk enough about the mental talent. And for me, that is the number one priority because to allow yourself to play for 15 or 17 years at the higher level, that means mentally you have to be really strong. So I think when we are recruiting player, and now that I'm in the other side, I put in a lot of time on the mental side of the game of the players before we recruit players. So mental, so, and just to sort of give a little bit of an answer, we won't have time to discuss it about this interaction. Obviously, if Messi had been born and then he'd never seen a ball until he was 18, presumably he still had that natural ability, but it would have been too late at the age of 18. So there would have obviously have to be an interaction between whatever this notion of latent talent is and practicing. What makes it complicated is that there may well be, when you talk about genes, you don't have a gene for tennis or a gene for soccer, but what you may have is a gene for deliberative practice. You may have a gene for focus. Um, and therefore, you're better at practicing per trial than everybody else. So it's probably uh, an interaction that makes it um, really complicated. Um, so will you be, are you wanting to tell us who you think is better out of Messi and no, no, uh, Cristiano Ronaldo? There is a lot of things. <laughs> but what I, the, the, the question that I will have for you is between the trial and the competition, there is two different types of, of pressure, I will say. Yes, exactly. So that, that's what you think I, you mean by the mental. So I think one of the other big areas in neuroscience is the distinction, and we've written about, you know, I've written about this, is the distinction between working with your hands and working with your mind. We're very schizophrenic in the world when it comes to sport. Because on the one hand, a billion people watch the World Cup. On the other hand, deep down, we sort of think that it means more to be a genius at mathematics or music than to be able to use the term for an athlete. And indeed, a couple of years ago, I remember I was called by a reporter at Time Magazine who wanted to know whether they could use the word genius to describe LeBron James. Because what does it mean to be physically a genius versus mentally a genius? Now, what we've argued, and I think neuroscience is saying, is that the distinction is a false one. There's as much cognition in sport as in any other endeavor. Okay. But when you use the word mental, I think what you mean is not just, and we'll talk about what I mean in terms of the cognitive component, but you mean being able to live under pressure, don't you? The, the ability to sort of get through the fame and the nerves and that's what you mean, right, as, as well yeah, as the physical. Yeah, that's what I mean. But as well, uh, I think when you look, talk about the game of football, it's not just about 10 against 10 who running around to try to win the game and try to score. I think there is some tactical knowledge in the game that 
will help you to be more successful in the game. So that is part as well of how players handle the pressure uh, on, on of the field, and as well how they can um, concentrate about what they've been working in the week, so they can do it in the weekend as well. So there is a lot of element, mental element, um, for the players to allow him or not to to play at his best. So. It is quite a fascinating game. You know, no, it, it is. I mean, just to just you know, go down the rabbit hole here, I mean, Wittgenstein famously said you couldn't define what a game is, and I think it's, it's also very difficult to define what a sport is. But what's interesting about sports, unlike video games, is you don't get bored with them. Right? People will watch soccer or go and play tennis, and, and why is that? What, what is it that makes a sport a sport? And one is, it's exactly what you're saying, is that it contains the requisite degree of complexity. You have to be technically good, you have to be physically good, you have to be cognitively good, you have to be mentally good. And we seem to have evolved between the sports that we've created and the kind of talents you need to play these complex sports and enjoy them. So what we seem to be are complexity makers and complexity detectors. So when we look at a bit of architecture or a piece of music or we watch soccer, we are actually admiring its complexity. We sort of tacitly know how hard it would be to ever be that good. All so, right, so, so we have... The, and that's they are a whole genius. Er yes, we, we, we have that whole area of detection of, of complexity. So, okay, so, so let's say we agree that there's a, such a thing as talent. It's a combination of being born with it and then practicing it in some multiplication of the two. Um, and I was arguing with my younger brother, Eric, who's here, who knows a thousand times more about soccer than I do. And so I just said, OK, here's my null hypothesis. The best team is just the team with enough money to buy the most talented individuals. And so the best team is just the sum of talented individuals. So if I could put you and Messi and any other bunch of players who are deemed the best, that would be the best team, and they would always win. Is that correct? No. Why not? <laughs> <laughs> because that is, that is, I believe that this is why people are really fascinated about our game. Because the money will not gonna make you win trophies. It will help you because you will have the best coach, you will have the best player, but then... But statistically, the, 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 the rich teams tend to win. Yeah, but not all the time. Because with the money that they invest in the game, like especially the teams in England, they invest a lot, but they are not winning the Champions League. The Champions League always going to... Is it, are they buying players or are they... They're they, buying players, they invest the money nicer on buildings. coaches as well. Mm. But what I mean is that you have the money that will help you to be successful, but it doesn't guarantee you success because behind that money you need to work on the tactical side of the game, on the psychological side of the game. Um, you have team, I think, when you look at the team last year, Leicester, who managed to win the Premier League, and they had maybe the 10, 11, or 12 budget in the, tr in the Premier League, and they managed to win the Premier League. We're going to get to Leicester City in a minute. You know, it's amazing, actually. I was talking to my brother about this, and your you know, the Messi, Cristiano, you know, comparison, and then Leicester City. But I just want to get back to this. So there's a, there was an article written a number of years ago about Michael Jordan, and, and I wrote a little bit about this too, which is that this, this notion of not just seeing the ball and being skilled. You know, if you watch a single player practicing, you'll go, wow, aren't they good with the ball, right? But then when you're out on the pitch, you need to have what we talk about in, in, in neuroscience, a kind of cognitive map of the entire pitch. So Wayne Gretzky in ice hockey, Michael Jordan would say famously that they could see all the players and they could time advance the positions of all the players a few seconds in advance and know before they were there where to kick the ball, where to hit the puck, or in Michael Jordan's case, literally throw the ball behind him without looking and know that there would be a player there to catch it. Do you believe this of idea course, of, of a course. cognitive map? Of course. And I think this is why is Michael Jordan, and this is why Zidane was Zidane, and Messi is Messi. And this is why, as well, you have people who are playing in the Premier League, 
you have people who play in the championship and you have people who play in the bottom league. So you have talent to be a football player, but the talent that you have and the way you see in the map will allow you to play in a different level. Because I, I think that's exactly right. I think a lot of people who don't talk to athletes and don't think about maps think it's just, you know, they run faster, they hit harder, no. right? No, right, I mean, I'm, yeah. I, but in fact, this is what I mean by this discrepancy between the physical and the cognitive is, is false, is because of this notion that the best players are able to create very complex models of the entire game in time, all the players in space, and then time advance that map um, over time. Now, that's an incredible feat. That is no different, I should tell you, than what chess grandmasters do, right? When a, a grandmaster, you can show them for 25, 30 seconds a configuration of pieces on the board, take it away, and they can reproduce all the pieces on the board, right? Players on a pitch, pieces on a board, the same cognitive challenge, the same neuroscientific idea, right? And I think one of the players that... <clears throat> that was the best for me was uh, Dennis Bergkamp, the player that I had the chance to play with when I was uh, in London at Arsenal. Because he understood the game quicker than everybody else. He's reading the game quicker than everybody else. And that was, that is the reason why he was paying more than everybody else, because of that special talent. And those players is really rare yeah. to find because those players will make you win games and, um, and we are talking just about a fraction of, of second here. But the way that you will give him the ball, he will understand what is the next pass before anybody else on the field. And, uh, and I think that is the difference between being a good player and a top player. I completely agree in, 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 in the work that we're starting to do. And it's interesting that neuroscience is way behind uh, what's happening in the world of sport and other domains. In other words, we do very simple reductionist experiments, but the problem is that those experiments don't have, uh, what I was talking about before, the complexity of soccer, the complexity of chess. So we're looking at the brain doing things where the brain is not actually being asked to do what you're describing. So there's a gulf between what we study in the lab and what we know the brain is capable of. Um, out in the world. Now, the good thing about sports compared to art and chess is you actually have more variables you can measure because there's all that motor output. Um, so, okay, so let's just say that ability and talent exist. It's not what you think it is in sport. It's as cognitive as any other activity as well as physical. Um, now, let's talk about credit assignment. Um, people talk about coaches, okay? And coaches seem to get an enormous amount of credit um, and <laughs> now I don't know, <laughs> so let me explain why I'm starting skeptically and of course I'll be won over entirely in a moment, but <laughs> there, is a, there is the illusion of expertise in the world, right? And, and Danny Kahneman and Tversky, who basically came up with the notion of behavioral economics, uh, won the Nobel and they wrote a book, Thinking Fast and Slow, and there are wonderful chapters in this book about people who think they're experts, like stockbrokers, for example. Um, and it's basically random, right? So it's very easy to develop cults of expertise when, in fact, it's not true. Okay? But that doesn't mean there isn't expertise, just so that there are talented individuals and there are good players and bad players. So I was just wondering... Um, who should get the credit, really? If I have a team full of really talented players, why does one need a coach at all? There's always this question where you're asking if the coach is making the team or the team is making the coach. That's exactly what I'm asking. <laughs> <laughs> I believe that the players are making the coach. Okay. Yeah, but at the same time, coaches are quite really important because they are the one who give a direction to the team because you can be on the field, you can have the talent that you want, but to be successful, you need a structure. 
And when you have a good structure to allow you to express your talent, then you will have more chance of being successful. So I believe that it's good to have 11 really good players. But in our world, those 11 players need to understand that the team and the structure will allow them to express their talent. And I believe that if the coach is not strong enough or is not good enough, then the team will not going to have a chance to be successful. But, uh, the team will be good enough to win a game. Yeah, but they won't win the whole thing. They will not win the whole thing. But how do you, so here's the question, right? And I mean, and I'm not a big soccer person. And I, if my brother's mic'd up there somewhere. We, he should he, come to sit yes, next to yes, me. Yes, he should come to well, I, I thought he should, yes. So no, I was hoping just to have him sort of whispering in my ears electronically. <laughs> but how do you know? So in other words, I always seem to, you know, that a coach does well, the team does well, it's the same coach, and then the team starts to do badly, right? And then the coach is asked to leave. But how do you know that it isn't just noise in the system, and they get the credit when they're doing well, and they get blamed when they're doing badly, but a little bit like what I was saying about the hot streak, the free throw line, it's just chance. How do we know that we're just giving credit to something which might just be noise. It's complicated, there are lots of players, there are other teams, and sometimes the coach will have a good streak, and sometimes the coach will have a bad streak, and if we took enough time to watch, they'd have another good streak. But, so do you, do you see what I'm saying? Or do you think it's true that they've just passed their sell-by date? I think it's, I don't think you can put your finger in um, only one, uh, issues in there. Um, we had that problem because when I was at Arsenal for nine years, we never managed to win the championship back to back. We did it once, we finished second, we did it another year, we finished second, we never won it back to back. And right. that, was a, that was a problem. And the manager is still the same. Yeah, I mean, after 20 losers. years, they still the same. <laughs> right. They changed the players, but not the manager. So, I strongly believe that in our time we had one of the most talented, strong team in England. And not winning the league back to back was underachieved for that generation of players. And for me, we was missing something, something that the coach didn't give us. But so just so I understand, forgive me, I don't know the details. Is it, so in other words, there's, it's the same coach in a year that you win. Yes. It's basically the same team the next year. With the same coach. With the same coach and you lose. Yes. So how can you blame anybody? Because it was a lack of, of demanding from the coach. Because when you win, you become really lazy. You not have the same work ethic than the year before. So you're saying that there's some kind in of our relaxing. Mind, relaxing. And that became a big problem for us because we were a little bit complacent. In training, we didn't give as much as the year before. And then it became more difficult because if physically, mentally, you are not prepared to play games, you don't have any chance of winning games. So let's say I and buy that, that. And that, you're going to buy it. <laughs> <laughs> and just to give you another example. It was in uh, the World Cup in 98, the same things as well. We had a terrific team. We managed to win the World Cup in, 2000 and, uh, in 98, and then we won the, uh, the Euro uh, 2000. And then we went to, um, to the World Cup in 2002. We had Thierry Henry at the time, who was the best goal scorer in the Premier League. We had Gibril Sissé, who was the top scorer in the French League. We had David Trezeguet who was the top scorer in the Italian league. We didn't manage to score one goal in that competition. And we were out in the first round. Not because of the coach or because he was just after winning the World Cup and the European Championship, we became arrogant. We French is normal, it's part of our culture. <laughs> but <laughs> we're pretty good at it in England too. Yeah. <laughs> but we... We, we stopped working. We became a little bit more spectator than actor. We, 
we were too much uh, uh, wanted to be on TV, we wanted to be doing some uh, publicity. We, we didn't give the same focus and concentration on the field that we used to go to do. And then we didn't have any chance of being successful anymore. And then when we realized that we wanted to flick it around, it was too late, that generation was over. So do you mean, so you're saying that when you were in that sort of arrogant mode, even though you were all spectacular, that if Leicester City had come along, they would have beaten you? Yes. Right, so in other because words... Because there's a lack of respect for the other team. We didn't respect the team like we used to because we were the world champion. Right. So we're going to talk about Leicester City in a minute. Um, but it's just, I, I, do, I do think that, just to let you know this, I think you're right about this sort of motivational component. Well, just half right. <laughs> um, <laughs> let's not exaggerate. Um, no, there's a motivational thing, which is definitely true, that in neuroscience, there's a lot of data being generated now showing that there are motivational modulators on top of your skill. In other words, it's not like all of you were less skilled suddenly. Yeah, right? The skill right. was invariant. And yet, the, 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 even though the skill level, if you could go in and measure it, was invariant, the performance was not as good. So what, what we in neuroscience are interested in is the modulators on the fundamental property that leads to a change in the performance. Right? So if, for example, if you give a monkey uh, four targets to look at, and one of the targets has a drop of juice, they will make a more skilled movement to that. So we know that reward in animal models and neuroscience um, can modulate skill immediately, not practice. You just go ka-chunk like this. Right? So it's really interesting um, to think about the modulators on skill rather than skill. And so when you talk about having a natural ability, it may not just be a natural ability at the level of the skill, but it's an ability to actually do better with your modulators. So in other words, you're less nervous, the negative modulators, and you're more motivated, the positive modulators. Right? So it's very interesting, this convergence of having these amazingly skilled players. They won the year before. The coach is the same. It's still the same size ball, for God's sake. And yet, the performance is not as good, despite the skill level not changing. Right? So that's extremely interesting in, in neuroscience because the circuits in the brain that are responsible for the modulation of motivation versus the circuits which are then impinged upon by these circuits to actually just be skilled in your execution are not the same. So in other words, it probably means that one has to practice differently not to be arrogant, not to be nervous, compared to actually practicing a drill, for example. But this is why I believe the coach has a massive part to play on that kind of motivation as well. So what, meaning that you think that in retrospect there would have been a way for you in the player's locker room to have said, yeah, de-arrogant yourself. Play, players and, and coaches and coach. And I think that's why the coach is massively important in the success of a team. The success of a team. The coach seeing what's going on should be the one who keep them together. So, what you're basically saying is that the coach also relaxed. Of course, of course. Or, just think that, okay, no, everything is good, they're gonna turn up on the day of the game. Um, okay, so let's go, now, another area of great interest, right, is soccer, like other team sports, is really interesting, because you've got individuals, who are very talented, we've talked about those. You've got coaches. And then you have the team itself, which is, you don't talk about a talented team. You talk about a winning team, right? Because you, team... you judge by what you achieve at the end of the season. Right, so the, the team performs, but the players can be talented, yeah. right? So, and you know, in physics, for example, they've solved the two-body problem. But as soon as you get to the three-body problem, the interactions you know, just exponentially go up. It's very difficult to model multiple bodies. So in, in, in science, it's very difficult to go from individuals to teams. Do you, do you think, as a coach, because we can't solve it yet in science, there's a difference between training a team to play together versus what you need to train each individual player to do? Uh, do you separate those? 
we majority of our training is collective. Mm -hmm. But to improve the individual skills, we need to do some individual training session. So how do you do that? Do, do you interleave it? Do you have days when it's individuals? and We days have days where it's individual. We have days where there's only unit. Unit by, uh, mean by uh, the back four or the midfield three or the front three. We do some specific trainings to to improve their weakness or their, their, uh, their strength. But what you talk about the coaches and, and the dressing room about working with, with the team is quite really difficult in our world because in the dressing room you have different culture, different languages, different religion. So you have to take all these kind of different aspects into consideration when you want to work on something specific. So that's why the, uh, the work of the coach, it's really difficult because like in New York City, we have players that we recruit this year and um, the first language is Spanish. So to speak in English is quite difficult for them at the moment. They need to adapt themselves. And, uh, and that can take time. So as a coach, I know that we have a young player for the first time, he's leaving his country. He's come to a country like New York, a country like the U.S., a city like New York. He doesn't know anybody. He doesn't speak the language, yeah. and he's living by himself. So I have to take that into consideration regarding his performance because he may need time to adapt himself to even the league. So that's why a coach is really important. Right. I mean, it, I mean, I think there's that parental pastoral role, right? I mean, obviously these are young people, they're far from home. I have no doubt that that more avuncular... That is, that is not easy to deal with. Yeah, yeah. That is not mm -hmm. easy to deal with because you used to live in, in Panama and you have your family around, you mm -hmm. come to the big city like that, you're by yourself, the language is quite really tough and really difficult for you to understand. So it's really difficult for me to ask this player to play the, the way that I know he can do. So about, for me, I just said, okay, how can I help him to feel like he's at home? And that will allow him to play at the level that I right, know I mean, he I can do. I mean, I think you can see what we meant about in soccer contains all the problems of the world in its universe. It's almost fractal. It's as complex itself as the world is, even though it's a subset. Of it, you have to do. You have to be a psychologist. You know, you have to be a physicist. You have to be a tactician. You have to be a physical therapist. I mean, it's a, it's a vast, vast thing. And I should tell you again, in neuroscience, we still debate a lot what the best way to train somebody is. In other words, do you do the individual training on a Monday and a Wednesday and a Friday? Do you do the teamwork on a Tuesday and a Thursday? Uh, do you do you know, I know more about tennis, a backhand for an hour and then a forehand for an hour, or do you do five minutes, five minutes, five minutes? And there's a huge field of how to best consolidate and how to best mix it. And again, the best coaches and the best teams have solved tacitly, without ever writing it down formally, these rules. And it's fascinating. I mean, would you, do you, would you write a book about how to train someone? Are you thinking about that? No. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe no, we'll, but, I'll go but straight it, it, with it you. is quite fascinating because we have one of our best players, David Villa. Um, we played the game on the, on the Saturday. On the Friday, he liked to take the balls and going to do like five penalty shootouts. Right, right. We have players who, uh, the day before the game, they just like to do some rituals, uh, long passes, or someone, some of them just want to do some, some finishing. So what you were talking about early on, about how can we train those players? We have the collective and we have the individuals because the individuals, they are feeling like preparing themselves better for the game on the Saturday. So as a coach, I like to do some tactical work that involve the majority of the players. But during the week, the way I plan the week is to give them two days in the week where they can do individual practice and they do what they like to do just because that will give them more confidence and more belief on what they can do in the weekend. You see, and, and, and what's so great about this is that 
it probably works empirically, right? But you can't run these as experiments, right? Because think about it. I mean, if I were to say in an experiment or write a paper and I said, this is what works, they would go, well, prove it. You need a control group, right? You, you need to do it in another way, all right? So in, in other words, it, it's interesting that there's all this knowledge that is probably true on optimal ways to train people, optimally prepare people so they're not homesick, they're not nervous, that you can get their best, you can make them use motivation in the proper way. We, as I said before, study these in fragments and in simplified tasks. And, and I'm really personally trying to think of a way to extract the truth from the way you do it, which I'm sure is right, without someone saying, well, what if you didn't do it that way? You made them do tactical stuff for five days and they could only have one day to do their free passes or whatever it is. I mean, it, th this is the struggle, and this is true in medicine, this is true in many other areas where there's this long handed down tacit knowledge that seems to work, and yet we don't know how to make use of it to come up with theories. Do, do, it, it, it's fascinating. I, yeah, it is fascinating because all the coaches that I went to learn from, they all have a different right. way of seeing the game. But that doesn't mean one is better than the other one. Or, one or maybe it doesn't one. matter. Right? There's yeah, some core I, thing that they're all doing underneath the dressing. I don't think there is a good way. It's difficult as a scientist. Do you see what I'm saying? This is, this is the fundamental thing. In I, science, yeah. we believe there's an optimum. And yet, what it would, but, 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 but what's But it would be good to know what you guys are thinking, you know? But. Maybe. <laughs> um, I think we'll finish with, an, with another very interesting issue, which is about... Um, adversity and having to have suffered a little bit early on in order to achieve greatness. Now, what's interesting, and I wanted to get your opinion on this, is um, I, I recently was asked to write a commentary on a study that's just been done on um, British gold medalists. And they wanted you to look at the difference between people who get gold medals at the World Championships or at the Olympics versus people who go to the Olympics. They're good enough to compete, but they don't medal. Right? So it's not like they're not skilled. I mean, they're going to the Olympics, for God's sake, but they're not winning. So then it leads to the difference between talent and skill and the ability to win. Right? Now, one possibility is what we were talking about before. Now, about motivation and using it. But what was interesting, and I want to hear what you have to say about this, is they found some interesting things about those people who end up being winners. I saw the article. Right? And what they found was that they had some kind of traumatic event early on in life. Something, the loss of a parent, an illness, something. And then not long after that traumatic event, they found some kind of mentor figure. So it was like this dyadic event, something negative followed by something positive where you channeled that into... And, you know, I actually wrote in my commentary that it's not a coincidence that whether it's Batman or Spider-Man or Luke Skywalker, right, they all have something horrible happen. And, you know, they basically lose a parent or a relative. And then they meet their Obi-Wan or something like that. And um, now, when I was asked to write this commentary, I, I, I said, you know, I don't think that coaches or scouts are going to surreptitiously eliminate the parents of the most promising <laughs> athletes. <laughs> but I was just wondering if you agree with the conclusions of this study that the people who end up not just being the skill but the winners had to have some kind of adverse experience growing up that they had to be rescued from. Does that make sense to you? That makes sense. That makes sense and I completely agree with you. Would you say that that would describe you? That would describe me. And uh, that will describe the majority of the players that I had a chance to play with uh, in '98, because the trauma was the separation from uh, my, my parents. And of course, um, born in Africa, moving to France, that was a trauma as well. Living uh, a tough childhood, that was a trauma. And um, it was fascinating because I was sharing a rooms with uh, one of my teammates at the time, was Lilian Turam, who was my best friend at the time in the, in the French national team. 
And uh, when we started to know each other, and uh, he was talking uh, to me about uh, his uh, childhood, and I just felt like he was talking about me mm. because the parents separated, he moved from Guadeloupe, went to France, and uh, a lot of sisters, brothers around. I had only one brother, but big family. And, uh, and that was a trauma, and I think that trauma helped me and helped him as well to go through to the tough period that we had when we were going through a uh, competition where we was like a hundred of kids and they're just gonna pick up the, the five kids or when we're going to a game and we went through a difficult period in the game. And I think that trauma um, built my character. And that's why I strongly believe that the difference, I don't know the answer, between the winners or the losers or between the people who make it to the high level and the other one is not just about the talent. I think it's the trauma that they had behind. And, uh, and I think that helped them as well to, uh, or helped me to, uh, to play at the level that I played. So this is what, exactly, this is what this study is suggesting. So isn't that kind of awkward? Does that mean then that if you have people now at the New York City Football Club and you find out about them and they've had incredibly privileged, lovely lives and they're talented, you'll just hit the eject button? I'm afraid you haven't... <laughs> will, you, will you say, I'm afraid you haven't suffered enough? No, of course not. That would be the simple way of doing things, but... Well, it seems like I'd, I'd, I'd think about it. <laughs> That, is, that, that will be part of how we recruit players now. Because, because it's an element, I think, who can help you to make a decision about the type of players that you bring into your football club. Because I think the background can help you to know which type of person you are in adversity. And, um, and with the experience that I had as well, that is maybe the reason why I, I strongly believe in that. Um, and that's why we, and for me, that will have a, a big part to, uh, to bring players to our football club. Yeah, I mean, it, it's really fascinating. Again, you know, the players know this, the filmmakers know it, you know, the comic, comics know it. And yet the study that is done to sort of try and statistically show that trauma plus subsequent mentorship is a predictor of being a medalist versus not, just shows you the kind of fact that the, that the truth was known before it could be proven, right? And you knew it. So, you know, there's this paper, I wrote a commentary, and you'll just go, well, uh, duh, yes, we've known this for a very long, long time. So that's the big challenge, and this is why these discussions, I think, are so helpful, is how do we extract all this knowledge and then turn it into something that can be verified? Right, so I mean, I, I think this is gonna be, you'll see it increasingly as we get better at instrumenting people, wearables, um, all sorts of wearable tech. We're gonna be able, scientists like me are gonna be able to come to you know, the New York City Football Club and instrument all the players. He's and, looking for a <laughs> I'm not, I'm really not, I'm really not. Uh, no, but so, this is really fascinating. But, and, and then actually, um, but you know, I, I, if, if, I, it was my, if, I, if duty called. Um, so, uh, but I think that there will be a way actually to, to bridge this divide and actually For sure. with, For with sure. wearables. Are you, are you, just to finish, and then we'll take questions, are you using technologies at all? Are you using virtual reality or no, not wearables yet. or anything no, like that? Not yet. Has you been, have you been approached no, about that? We've been approached, but we didn't find. Um, we didn't find a way to use it properly. And I think we don't have all the elements to allow ourselves to use it because we don't have the, the answer about what can that bring to the player. Right, have you been approached at all by Halo Neuroscience? Have you heard about these? It's these headphones that have a transcranial direct current stimulator in them. For have, me, the have you guys heard just about to to music. Yeah, I know, I know. <laughs> but but there, there, there are now, movements to have people who are training in professional teams and in the military to wear these uh, stimulators during practice. Uh, you know, I'm not actually for it. I've actually been interviewed and been quite negative about it. But I was just wondering what you would think if there were ways to take athletes 
and to stimulate their brain to make them better players. Do you think that would be cheating or do you think that would be a good idea? That would be a really good idea. Whereas, interesting, right, stimulating the brain to make people better, but you wouldn't think that dr taking drug enhancing would not be, right? No, but how can you do it, though? You, you can. There's a, there's a way to do it. I think this is the other future coming is what kinds of enhancement will we consider okay versus what kinds of enhancement will we not consider okay? And I think that's another place where the science, the neuroscience and the sport will come together. So anyway, as you, I hope you can tell, it's just vast territories that could be covered and how we're actually going to bring them together is going to be an evolving story. And,